I, I pretty much count myself lucky daily that I teach at a place like Bard where we um, have a culture that has been influenced um, by a, a long tradition, but now 41 years of Leon Bostin being president, um, where uh, risks are taken, the life of the mind is, is valued, and um, we can always expect uh, a real conversation at a faculty meeting and at a conference when he speaks. And it's one of the real um, pleasures to, to teach at a school where he's the president. Um, Robert Gardino was uh, a professor at Williams College in the 1960s and 70s, and he'd been a Peace Corps volunteer. And um, he took from that that putting yourself in difficult and uncomfortable situations was something uh, important for learning. And he argued that um, students should go to uncomfortable places. In this case, he set up a program where he sent students to India. And um, they should reflect on the work they do with local communities. He argued that students should actively promote, or college should actively promote a range of experiences that have the creative potential to unsettle and disturb. He died in 1974, but his legacy lives on. In 2014, a group of students at Williams started a new club called the Club for Uncomfortable Learning. And they set up a lecture series, a lecture series that's called the Uncomfortable Learning Lecture Series. Uh, the uh, inaugural speaker in that uh, lecture series was Greg Lianoff, who will be speaking here later today. We at Bard at the RN Center have actually modeled a new lecture series called Tough Talks on that lecture series. And it will premiere in November uh, with um, Bill DeResovitz's lecture, uh, and he, he will be speaking tomorrow at the conference. It's paradoxical, however, that the Williams Club for Uncomfortable Learning last year disinvited two speakers. <laughs> First, the club had disinvited Suzanne Venker, the author of many books, including The War on Men and The Two Income Trap. Just months later, the club disinvited John Derbyshire, who calls himself a race realist, which means he thinks statistics show that the average black American to be more dangerous and less intelligent than white. Students protested. This time, however, the club held firm against the protest. The club president, uh, an African American at the time, said he disagreed with everything Derbyshire said, but he wanted to, as President Botstein just said, hear what he had to say so he could understand it and argue against it better. But the Williams president, Adam Falk, stepped in and banned Derbyshire from the campus. Falk wrote in a letter to the campus, today I am taking the extraordinary step of canceling a speech. He wrote, free speech is a value I hold in extremely high regard. But he added, there is a line that cannot be crossed, and Derbyshire had crossed it. The disinvitations at Williams are not isolated instances. Last year, UC Berkeley disinvited the gay and libertarian internet entrepreneur Peter Thiel, lately a major donor to Donald Trump. UC Berkeley's former chancellor, Robert Bergenau, had his speech at Haverford College canceled because during his tenure, police used batons to disperse protesters. At Oxford, a scheduled debate with invited pro-life guest speakers was canceled following pressure from activists. Smith College disinvited Christine Lagarde, the head of the International Monetary Fund. At the University of Chicago, which has lately affirmed its commitment to free speech, students shouted down and prevented a talk by Anita Alvarez, the first Hispanic state's attorney in Chicago, because she had waited 13 months before releasing the video of the police shooting of Laquan McDonald. Also at the University of Chicago, Bassan Eid, a Palestinian activist uh, against the BDS movement, uh, was prevented from speaking. Dustin Lance Black, the Oscar-winning screenwriter of Milk, was disinvited from Pasadena City College. The University of Pennsylvania disinvited CIA Director John Brennan. Scripps College disinvited George Will, the columnist. Brandeis University invited the Muslim critic of Islam, Ayan Hirsi Ali. And famously, Rutgers disinvited former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. 
Rice has been disinvited four times. President George W. Bush has been disinvited seven times. John McCain and Ben Carson have each been disinvited three times. This list could go on. As this chart shows, the trend of disinvitations is growing. There are currently over 25 disinvitations each year, up from about five per year in the opening years of the century. How has this happened? How has the act of listening to somebody with an opinion far into one's own come to be seen as dangerous? Is this groupthink? Is this political correctness? Is it a kind of neo-totalitarianism? Or is it something new that we still have to think about and try and understand? To answer this question, I think it's very careful that we, important that we listen carefully to what the students arguing for disinvitations have to say. For example, in agonizing over whether Venker should be allowed to speak at Williams, the editorial board of the Williams Record provided three reasons for why it makes sense not to allow Venker to speak at Williams. First, they write, and here's the number one on the slide, in general, the college should not allow speech that challenges fundamental human rights and devalues people based on identity markers, like being a woman. Much of what Venker has said online in her books and interviews falls into this category. Does Venker devalue women? I think that's an unfair way of putting it. Venker argues, among other things, that feminism has been better for men than women. She picks one example, marriage. Feminism, she writes, has led to a situation where modern women want to get married. The trouble is that men don't. She says that men feel marriage is less valuable to them because of feminism, because they don't get a loving and obedient wife who supports them. So men take what feminist women offer them, sex without commitment, without offering what many women really want, a loving marriage. And she concludes, and you can read in red this, and you can read the longer argument here, Feminism, she says, serves men very well. They can have sex at a low and even live with their girlfriends with no responsibilities whatsoever. It's the women who lose. Fenker's opinion is an attack on my worldview, and yet I find something worth confronting in her argument. We need to hear from different women, including women for whom feminism has been foreign and even counterproductive. Only then can we learn how feminism might better reflect the needs of a greater number of women. Her opinion is not wrong so much as it is limited. And reading her, I better understand the limits of my own opinion. That is enough reason, I think, to hear her speak. The second reason the editors give is that hearing from Venker will lead to emotional injury. While free speech is important, and there are problems, they write, with deeming speech unacceptable, students must not be unduly exposed to harmful stereotypes in order to live and learn here without suffering emotional injury. It is true that stereotypes can be harmful, and if the speech reaches the level of repeated harassment or hate speech, it should be punished as the law requires. But how is it dangerous and harmful to have Susan Venker bring her stereotypes about women to campus? The argument, I think, turns on the word emotional injury, or the words. The claim of emotional injury invokes a medical discourse of trauma, that Venker's speech would trigger trauma. I take the claim of trauma with the utmost seriousness. There are people who have suffered in war, have been persecuted for their religion, have seen their families murdered, or have been raped, who are seriously traumatized by their experiences. I've had students inform me of such instances, and I have tried to work with them and encourage them, among other things, to seek qualified medical help. But I'm not sure what emotional injury Venker's speech might inflict. The language of trauma used here assumes that since some students suffer from trauma, all should be treated as if they were traumatized, which does risk, I think, invent infantilizing the student body. Moreover, the editors seek to shut down speech by medicalizing dissent. If they had said that Venker's ideas were offensive, they would be told that ideas are protected by the idea of comfortable learning, uncomfortable learning. By invoking trauma, the students strategically make speech a question of health, and they thus mobilize an administrative bureaucracy 
designed to ensure the safety of young people. Claims of trauma shut down debate by invoking a medical discourse that is immune to rational argument. The third argument the editors make is that college should be a safe space for students. They write, it is possible that some speech is too harmful to invite to campus. The college should be a safe space for students, a place where people respect others' identities. Vanker's appearance would have been an invasion of that space. Now, I agree with President Botstein that the idea of a safe space is meaningful. It has its origins in the 1960s when sodomy laws and homophobia still made it unsafe for gays and lesbians to congregate in any public space, including gay bars. Later, safe spaces were adopted by feminist groups to name a space where women could gather as a community. In this sense, we all need safe spaces in which we can remove our tough public masks and be ourselves. There is nothing wrong with the idea of a safe space. But the rhetoric of safe spaces has mutated, divided, and expanded amoeba-like in the last decade. Safe space now means cleansing an entire institution of offensive ideas. Speakers can be disinvited or shut down with heckling if their views strike some as unsafe. And books are censored. At Duke, Christian students demanded to be excused from reading Fun Home, a graphic novel of a loving great gay relationship which violated their safety. White nationalists now demand safe spaces. By expanding this rhetoric of safe spaces to classrooms and lecture halls where learning should be uncomfortable, we trivialize the need for real safe spaces. What we need to do is to teach with common sense and respect to make these classrooms and lecture halls safe spaces for the kind of uncomfortable learning that Robert Gaudino suggests learning must be. When the idea of safe spaces is used at Williams as an excuse to shut down debate, we have a problem. We live in a country that has nominated a candidate who insults and harasses women. He challenges the legitimacy of the first black president. He insults the Muslim parents of a war hero. He gives voice to long pent up racial, sexual, and religious resentments. And now he questions the very basis of our democratic system. One reaction is to go ostrich to put our heads under the sand, refuse to listen, to barricade ourselves in safe rooms, homogenous Facebook threads, and ideologically slanted news. But safety is not working. The time for avoiding conflict is over. Erica Hunt, who will be speaking later today, writes in the Boston Review of Books that we need to cheer troubled waters, shifting pronouns, and blurred lines between lines between genres and disciplines, in the muck, green shoots. I agree. We need to jump into the muck and hope for the green shoots. We need to risk wading into dangerous waters. Just this month, Randall Stevenson, the CEO of AT&T, gave a speech on race. He spoke of his friend Chris, an African-American doctor, Chris was asked to talk to his church about his reaction to the police shootings of unarmed black men. Chris told how he was the first black child to integrate his elementary school, how he saw his house attacked with bricks, how his father had to fire a shotgun to scare away intruders. He told how he was called names and was asked to serve people in restaurants while dining. He told about being refused service, being pulled over at routine traffic stops, and having to carry his license when jogging to show the police he lives in his neighborhood. Now, many of us know these stories, but Mr. Stevenson, when he heard his friend tell the story, was ashamed. Because when Chris's, friend was, was Chris's son was dying, Stevenson and Chris had gotten on the ground on their knees and prayed together. They had stayed at each other's houses, gone on vacations together, and yet Stevenson had not known any of this history, of Chris's history of racial discrimination. Stevenson said, I wondered how two very close friends, one black and one white, could never have discussed the matter of race. I thought if two very close friends of different races don't talk openly about this issue, this issue that's tearing our communities apart, how do we expect to find common ground and solutions to what is a serious, 
serious problem. And from this story, Stevenson concludes that Americans need to begin the painful and uncomfortable task of talking honestly about race. He writes, and he says this to his AT&T employees, a group of AT&T employees who are designed to talk about community and racial issues. Let's talk about race. And this is what I particularly like about what he says. He says, I'm not asking you to be tolerant of each other. Tolerance is for cowards. Being tolerant requires nothing from you but to be quiet and not make waves, holding tightly to your views and judgments without being challenged. Do not tolerate each other. Work hard. Move into uncomfortable territory and understand each other. So let's talk about race. We start talking, me, a secular white Jewish man, you, a veiled Muslim woman, or you, an African-American from Baltimore, or you, a white working class student from Troy, or you, a student with dark skin from Burkina Faso, or you, a transgender woman, or you. I say, for example, let's talk about racial discrimination by the police. Of course, we all agree. Who can deny that black lives matter in a moment when unarmed black men are being shot and killed by police with unnerving regularity? It seems we might have an easy conversation. But maybe somebody says we should also be talking about the profiling of Muslims as terrorists. Or another responds, don't the police have to do their job? Others wonder whether we should equate religious and racial discrimination. Someone asks, what about rape culture and the fact that rapes are never prosecuted by the police? Someone else adds that in rare instances when rapes are, rapists are convicted, they get a mere six months in jail. Another says the groups most discriminated against are transgender and gay persons. One of us wonders if white male police officers are more guilty than black officers. A chorus insists that whites must own their white privilege. But someone points out that many of the police officers are lower class and underprivileged. Should we not worry about the violence done to lower class whites who risk their lives as public servants? Is it the fault of police, another wonders, that they, asked, that they are asked to solve violent social problems that the rest of our country willfully ignores? Someone asks what it means that the police operate in cities like occupying armies. And then one of us lets says, let's also talk about the gang problems in cities where young black youth are killing each other at much more alarming rates than police officers. Don't those black lives matter as well? <coughs> Shall we include social dysfunction and black-on-black -black violence in our discussion of police violence? Or is doing so a racist diversion? We speak tentatively and ask, is it racist to say? Others say, that is racist. More than one of us says, I'm not racist, but. There are long, uncomfortable silences as we stare fixedly at nothing. Anyone who's tried to teach this material knows what I'm talking about. We ask, is there a hierarchy of oppression? Some roll their eyes. We wonder, does a history of oppression make present oppression more impactful? Is one form of discrimination more important because it is older? Suddenly, this may be a long and difficult conversation. Is talking about such questions worth the risk? Freud may have shown that the talking cure works for psycho psychosomatic pain, but how is talking about race or these kinds of questions of discrimination and harassment anything more than touching an open wound? Is it just an excuse for people to express their racist views? Is progress happening? What would progress look like? I'm co-teaching a course this semester called Performing Difficult Questions. We've read essays by most of the people who are speaking over the next two days at this conference. The students have to create performances exploring how we can talk about difficult questions of race, sex, and religion. It's been amazing to see what they've come up with. In one performance, the creative team connected us, the audience, by a rope that we had to hold above our heads. We were told to close our eyes 
and given commands and questions that we had to respond to. One command, and I'll, one command told us to step forward if we were proud to be an American. I was the only one in the class who did and felt deeply self-conscious. One of the form performers then walked up behind me and in my ear read a quote from Shelby Steele about the progress of American race relations. Next, we were asked to speak aloud a word that offends us personally. I was struck dumb. Is there a word that offends me? If there were, would I say it? Does kike or Jew boy? Does white privilege? Does the N word? Does the C word? All words which were spoken aloud around me? I'm not sure any word really offends me. I remained silent. And they kept tapping me on the shoulder asking for my word. <laughs> the person next to me, when they tapped him, said, racist. I thought, hmm, does that offend me? It certainly makes me uncomfortable. What I loved about this performance was that as we were enacting our very personal differences, experiencing ourselves divided from the group in deeply personal expressions of vulnerability, we were holding on to a rope, gradually bumping into each other. Holding the rope above our heads gave us a common task. It bound us. By choosing to keep holding that rope and not throwing it down, we chose to join the group, even as we radically were individualized. The rope connected us to a collective endeavor, even as we divided ourselves. This student presentation offers a meditation on public bonds that can exist even amidst private difference. Even differences that are offensive and injurious. And this brings, me to, to, brings to mind a thought of Hannah Arendt that I would like to end with. Arendt writes, politics, politics is based on the fact of human plurality. That we are all different. Inex really different. One of the things I love about Hannah Arendt is she thinks that there is no political truth. Right? All there is is opinion. Um, that the effort to find truth in politics, to educate in politics, is always suspect. Politics, she writes, deals with the coexistence and association of different men. Men organize themselves politically according to certain essential commonalities found within or extracted from an absolute chaos of differences. I love that, an absolute chaos of differences. That's what I felt. And yet, politics is about the search for what unifies us amidst our differences. The escape from politics is the attempt to eradicate our differences and unify us by homogenizing us. Arendt, who suffered through totalitarianism, was always worried about that escape from politics. For her, plurality was what we had at all times to recall was the foundation of politics. Plurality means we accept and value the true and profound differences that separate us, the absolute chaos of differences that comprise the human race. Politics for our end is not the effort to normalize and neutralize our differences, to homogenize a citizenry into a civilized unit. She rejects Jean-Jacques Rousseau's idea of a general will according to which we shall be forced to be free. Freedom for our end is not the freedom of the will. Free will is not what she talks about. It's not even the freedom of a good will. Arendt understands, and this is unique in the history of political thinking, Arendt understands freedom to be the freedom to act. 
as she formulates it, to act and speak in public in ways that matter. To be able to act and speak so that people attend to you. To engage in politics, to appear in the world in meaningful ways. Against Rousseau's vision of a strong national state in which the people is sovereign, Arendt elevates the federalist idea in which multiple governing and non-government bodies in the country, the nation, the Congress, the president, the courts, states, counties, cities, towns, nonprofits, civic organizations, and more, all vie for power and control. She thinks this, we should not, the idea that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, she says is wrong. Power is what we need to protect ourselves from absolute power. And only in federalist local organizations is power created by people coming together and acting together. And so politics should encourage power, not discourage it. Thus, she writes, and this is, I think, the, to me, this is the fundamental statement of her politics. The great, and in the long run, perhaps the greatest American innovation in politics, and she thought that America had the great innovation of politics in the modern age, was the consistent abolition of sovereignty within the body politic of the republic, the insight that in the realm of human affairs, sovereignty and tyranny are the same. And so she saw the federalist structures, the intermediate institutions that Tocqueville talked about, the civic organizations, as a way of disallowing sovereignty and thus preserving plurality. Arendt embraces the American Federalist tradition because in abolishing sovereignty, federalism makes room for plurality. Now, we have to be honest, we've lost that Federalist tradition largely because many of the Federalist bodies imposed a kind of racial, sexual, religious homogeneity and the national government was brought in to fix that, to overcome that. The result, however, is an increasingly nationalist discourse. Perhaps Arendt's most controversial argument is her defense of discrimination. Right? Discrimination, she's very clear, has no place in, political, in the political or public sphere. But it is the lifeblood of society, she says, and of social life. What is wrong, Arendt asks, and we may think she's wrong, but we should at least hear what she asks. What is wrong, Arendt asks, with Jews having Jewish-only clubs? Or with Gentiles excluding Jews from their clubs? If Mormons want to pray with Mormons, why can't they? If black families want to have their kids educated in black schools, why shouldn't they? And then provocatively, Arendt says, if white families want to have white students educated in their schools, why shouldn't they? She's clear that you must not have laws preventing that people from having integrated schools. Segregation laws, she thinks, are an abomination. But she's willing to allow for people to choose to discriminate in their social worlds. So we might ask her, but why don't people, but, but won't people who socialize separately come to be at home with discrimination and won't this lead them to become prejudiced and transfer their social prejudices into public discrimination? It's a very fair and important argument. But Arendt doesn't think so. What prevents public discriminations, she argues, and what guarantees public equality something she believes absolutely is necessary, is not the absence of prejudice. She thinks prejudice is eternal, part of the human psyche. None of us, RN writes, can live without prejudice. If we count on a limiting prejudice in order to live a public life of equality, we will fail every time. Now, that doesn't mean we should give in to all prejudices. The act of politics, she says, is the act of challenging prejudices. But that's not to think that we're ever going to get rid of them. There's always going to be new ones. And so if you want to live equally, she says, 
Don't set your goal on eliminating prejudices. It's impossible. The key to public equality in RN's terms is not eradicating prejudice, but building and nurturing a commonly held public world that people of all different beliefs respect and value. One of my favorite metaphors in the Arendt's work is her imagination of a table around which we sit. The table, she says, connects us. We may be wildly different of all different races and sexes and views and religions, but sitting around that table, we are united by our recognition of the table and the common world of manners and civility that that table creates. But if some magical force, she asks, were to come along and remove the table, those of us sitting around it would lose our connection. We would, in our rent's words, suddenly become, quote, entirely unrelated to each other by anything tangible. Talking about difficult questions matters because as we talk, we form bonds that unite and connect us across our prejudices and differences. Arendt does not argue that free speech will lead to truth, that it will eradicate prejudice. The work of politics is not to find the truth, but to preserve this common world that bonds and connects us in spite of our many differences. Speaking freely about difficult questions only matters, she says, therefore, when people hear us and listen to us. Free speech is an important but an abstract right. Its only political importance, she writes, is when there is a public willing to hear what we say, which is why we have to have norms of civility and respect where all people feel empowered to speak and act in public. This is how Arendt understands the political value of speech. If someone wants to see and experience the world as it really is, he can do so only by understanding it as something that is shared by many people, lies between them, separates and links them. Showing itself differently to each and comprehensible only to the extent that many people can talk about it and exchange their opinions and perspectives with one another over and against one another. Only in the freedom of our speaking with one another does the world, as that about which we speak, emerge in its objectivity and visibility from all sides. It is my hope that over the next two days at this conference, a conference on real talk, you will all come to see more of the world as it really is, in all its richness, plurality, and troublesome messiness. This will likely be painful for many of us. It is always hard to learn that our views are partial, one-sided, and many of the opinions we will hear in this room will strike us as wrong. Some of you will no doubt be offended. We, find these words, we will find the words sexist, racist, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, politically correct, and totalitarian forming on our lips. Here is what I ask of us. Before responding with anger or resentment, I hope we will all make the effort to listen and to look, to hear and to see the common world we share emerging in its objectivity and visibility. I hope, in other words, that we will, in talking, in annoying, in offending, also come to find ourselves engaged in a common project of understanding, the beautiful multiplicity of this crazy and difficult world that we share. That is, I think, what Arendt means by her motto, Amor Mundi, to love the world. To begin our task of trying to learn and understand and love the world, I would like to call up our first group of speakers, our first panel, which will be moder moderated by Jennifer Doyle. Please welcome them. <laughs> 